Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, yes, I am Cindy Sampius, Applications Technical Lead for LICA. And today we're going to talk about the fundamentals of hematoxylin and niacin staining. One of the things that's been really fun with my job is being able to interact with customers as part of our cancer diagnostics process. And one of the biggest questions I get is about H&E. So, of course, why do we do it, right? Um, in this particular lecture, we're going to be looking at not only why we do it, we're going to talk about the components. Is it better to stain by hand or on a platform? We're going to suggest protocols and then try to find the right balance between your colors. What do artifacts look like and how can we troubleshoot some of those? How do I fix these things? And of course, at the very end, we'll talk about whatever questions you guys might have. So what is the H&E? Well, of course, for our routine diagnoses, we're using this as our baseline. This is what's getting us started. Um, it really gives us a great opportunity to look at the cellular and tissue structure in detail. So whenever your slide reviewer is looking at a particular tumor type, uh, whether it's benign or malignant, the stain intensity is, is one of the things that they're gonna look at to determine just how bad things are in some cases. When you're talking about uh, multiple chromosome anomalies in a nucleus, the more hematoxylin it picks up, uh, is more DNA that's present in that cell. And now at the end of the day, most of the folks reviewing slides have their preferred coloration uh, palette. Some people like it very, very pink. Others like it very, very blue. It just really depends on the end user and what they're looking for and of course how they were trained initially. But we're gonna talk about quite a bit of this today and, and the ways to balance that stain out to get that slide reviewer the exact coloration that they're needing for their diagnostics. So we have four basic components. We have our hematoxylin, our differentiator, which of course is going to uh, adjust the coloration of your hematoxylin, bluing, which is going to change the hematin from that reddish color to the blue color we're used to, and of course eosin, which is our cytoplasmic stain. So hematoxylin is, of course, an acidophilic dye, which means it's acid loving. So it's going to stain anything in your nucleus, which, of course, includes your DNA and your RNA. And there's a lot of different types of hematoxylin out there, and each one has a slightly different uh, coloration appearance. Um, historically, we used to make all these things in our laboratories. So you would have your hematoxylin powder and you'd mix it up. Now, the challenge with that was making sure that if I made hematoxylin this week, and you made hematoxylin next week, that we would get the nice balance there. And our preparation techniques could influence exactly how that colors look. So depending on who's making it, you're gonna have a stronger intensity or a weaker intensity. So the manufacturer commercially of the hematoxylin stain, whichever one you choose to use, has really made that quality nice and standardized. So you don't see those variations based on preparation. Now, when you uh, think about hematoxylin, um, oxidation of it actually is going to pr produce hematin, which is the actual dye in the stain. And you can actually see this by looking at the top of your hematoxylin. If you have it in a dish, you'll actually start to see it have almost a holographic appearance on top. It reminds me of the sheen you see with E. coli. Um, that's a sign that your hematoxylin is being oxidized. Now, one of the ways we stabilize our hematoxylin is by adding a mordant, and that gives the ability of the hematin to attach to an anion, something like iron, um, aluminum is another popular one that we use, and it helps, it just helps stabilize it. Hematoxylins are usually designed or classed by whichever mordant they're using. So like we said previously, the mordant is actually going to strengthen the positive ionic charge of the hematin. So it's going to aid in the bonding of the hematin to the anionic tissue uh, component, which of course is going to be your chromatin, your DNA, RNA. Now, uh, because we're using different mordants, that is going to influence the final color of the stain components. Um, those changes are very, very subtle across the board. Um, but if you have a particular preference, you will notice the difference between Mayer's hematoxylin, for example, and Harris hematoxylin. So the most common one that we use in routine histology is going to be your aluminum ammonium sulfate. Um, this is basically going to cause a nuclei to stain red in color until we rinse it with a weekly basic solution, i.e. our bluing solution, and it's going to change it to the more familiar blue color that you're used to seeing. 
Harris hematoxylin is the most commonly used alum hematoxylin, and it can be used for progressive staining and regressive staining of cytology specimens as well. Um, it tends to provide a little bit clearer nuclear detail. And um, one of the things though that you should know about it is that it can uh, be best differentiated with a mild acid as opposed to using hydrochloric acid, which is a very strong acid. Um, historically, we would use that. You would do one dip of the slide into your hydrochloric acid differentiator and you'd have to immediately get it into water. If you had it in there for two seconds, you could potentially completely decolorize the slide. Of course, we want to avoid that. So the mild acids with your hemotoxylin is going to make that change a lot more subtle and give you as, as much control as you could possibly want in order to make sure you get just the right color that you're looking for. And of course, Harris hemotoxylin is an alcohol-based stain. Another one of our hematoxylins that we're very familiar with, of course, is Mayer's hematoxylin. It's another alum hematoxylin, and it can be used both progressively and regressively, just like our Harris. Um, it's also used as a, a nuclear counter stain for many special stains and IHC. Um, it, it works really well in that uh, scenario. It doesn't give you too much blue and it doesn't tend to stain other, count, um, other components of the cells. Um, and when it's used as a counter stain, um, we want to see the nuclei, and of course, then we're going to blue the, the slide without using any differentiator because we really don't, we're not concerned about removing any excess hematoxylin at this point. And it is a water based stain as well. Gill's hematoxylin is another one of the, what I consider to be the big three. It's an, it's an alum hematoxylin. Um, it's often used progressive or regressive, and you can get it in lots of different concentrations, uh, predominantly, well, Gill 1, 2, and 3. It is typically used for cytology stains, but sometimes folks will use that in histology as well. Um, it's made with water and ethylene glycol, so the oxidation of the stain is prevented over months because of this, and it just makes it more stable than Harris hematoxylin. Now, the nature of gills is that it is there is some extra nuclear staining that may occur, so this is where your um, differentiator can be really important for getting rid of that extra staining. And uh, mucin and even other adhesives on the slide can actually stain blue in the background. So you will see some more background stain that you would be experiencing with some of the other hematoxylins out there. Uh, there are quite a few other uh, ones out there that use iron salts as a mordant, um, but they're usually in special stains. Um, this is because they generally will uh, demonstrate more tissue structures than the alum hematoxylins. So you can see things like myelin or elastin fibers. And of course, one of the best known out there is Weigert's, which we use in the Verhoff van Giesen stain or elastic stain. Now, the differentiator, we've talked about that just a little bit. Um, what this is basically doing is it's allowing uh, you to be able to selectively remove stain from tissues to get the coloration that you're comfortable with. So when you're talking about hematoxylin, hydrochloric acid was used historically. Of course, it's a very rapid differentiator. Um, acetic acid or citric acid are the ones that are mild acids. Those are going to be for a much more controlled differentiation. And those are the ones you're going to commonly see in laboratories. While hydrochloric acid was the standard, it's really started to become more fashionable, I guess, to use a milder acid because we are starting to use these things on um, platforms, automated staining instruments, that sort of thing. Um, and you're going to get a much gentler dye removal with that. You know, automated staining has really brought some amazing uh, opportunities into the laboratory for uh, increases in quality and production because we are able to do the same thing over and over again. Um, because you have those, you know, robotic arms on there, it makes it very easy for your text to load rack. The instrument takes off, does its thing, and now you've got your text free to do other things in the laboratory. So this slide is actually a really interesting one. This one was not had any differentiation at all. And if you notice, there is like a purple haze in the background. And the, the tissue itself, this is tonsil, uh, actually looks almost a little blurred. Now, in this case, I am using charged slides. So you can see in the lower right and left-hand corner of the slide itself, there are little plus signs indicating that they are charged. All that means is that the 
the slides are going to have the tissue adhere much more strongly. Your differentiator would be used and preferably a mild acid in this case. 30 seconds will get rid of this blue background for you. Um, that's easily. If you go up to a minute, now you're going to actually start being able to pull just a little bit of color out of the nuclei. So if you have overstained it, you can see where you know you have a little bit more room to play if you want to pull out more color or not. But 30 seconds is going to be the the minimum in order to get rid of all this blue background that we're seeing here on this charge slide. Now, differentiation, uh, things like colon, for example, which you can see in this image, depending on what you're looking at and who's looking at it, of course, um, you can notice that the goblet cells here are just very, very with the hematoxic. So depending on what you're looking for, there are some folks that had these types of GI samples. And in the uh, goblet, that's really important. So they do want that to be able. And this differentiation time to a progressive stain, and that way you'll be able to capture this, uh, the blue of this mucin in, in the uh, goblet cells. Now let's take a look at bluing reagents. So one of the most common ones out there is Scott's tap water. Certainly there are a wide variety of commercially available bluing agents out there that you can get to using your laboratory, but they all function in the same way in that they are a mildly basic solution that's going to change that hematoxylin from the red to the traditional blue color that we're used to seeing microscopically. And in this slide, you can see the impact of bluing. So you'll notice a nice distinctive line here where I dipped a slide in part way. You can see how the, the top of the, of the piece of tonsil is actually that purplish. Okay, I'm gonna try this again. Here's a great example of how bluing works. So if you take a look at this piece of tonsil here, you're seeing a nice delineated line here. Uh, the top half of the slide hasn't actually been exposed to the bluing agent, but the bottom half has. And this is one of those things um, in your protocols, you're gonna see that the bluing is typically about a minute. Um, mostly that's to accommodate movement of the robotic arms on any of the stainers that are out there on the market. Uh, but the thing to know with that is I literally dipped this slide in and pulled it right back out. And you can just see after one, one to two second exposure to the, uh, the Scott's tap water, it made a nice blue color here on the slide. All right, moving on to eosin. So of course, eosin is the most commonly used counter stain. This is what's gonna distinguish your uh, connective tissue, your cytoplasm from your nuclei. It's generally gonna be pink and there are different shades of pink depending on what type of tissue fiber it's uh, staining. So eosin Y of course is the most common form of this and it's you can make it both with water as a base or alcohol as a base. And just a small amount of acetic acid added to it will also sharpen that detail in your eosin. Uh, it's really kind of nice, especially if your eosin is weak, just add a drop of acetic acid to it and that should perk it right back up. Um, eosin with floxine is another common uh, mixture that we'll see when it comes to eosin. There are a lot of folks that really enjoy the, how it enhances the reds on their H&Es. So now, when you're talking about cytology, there are other mixtures. So in the case of eosin, uh, we talk about EA50, EA65. Um, these are going to add a little bit of light green, yellowish, and Bismarck brown to the eosin. So when you look at a cytology slide, for example, a pap smear, you'll see the teals, blues, pinks, all of those shades of color, and all of that's coming from your eosin. So just adding those two extra dyes is really what's gonna make the difference. And of course, the concentration of the eosin is determined by the designation of whether it's EA50 or EA65, which is gonna have the most eosin Y added to it. Well, now does eosin really need to be differentiated? Well, of course the right answer is yes. Um, a graded alcohol, most commonly 95, some folks will go as low as 70% alcohol. Um, and that's ideal to remove any of the excess eosin that may be in the tissue. So what you'll be able to see is the three different shades of pink, um, because when you have too much eosin, just like with too much hematoxylin, if you don't get some of that excess out, then the whole thing is just going to be a very bland one color. And of course, that's not what we're looking for, right? Higher grades of alcohol, 
um, can also be used following eosin, but remember it's the water that's doing the differentiation for you. That's what's gonna pull out that excess uh, pink. So if you go straight from eosin to 100, that's going to impact your coloration. So what's better? Should we stain the stuff by hand or should we use a platform? Well, I can tell you as somebody who has done a lot of staining by hand over the years, um, the platform has just improved, in my opinion, the quality and the quantity of work that we're able to get through in the laboratory. For one thing, your staining is gonna be very consistent. It's gonna be reproducible. Uh, of course, your technologist hands-on time, they can go off and do the other things that may need to be done in the laboratory. Now, there are some concerns about potentially longer protocol times. And back in the day, we used to say, well, I have to have a 25 minute H&E stain. And we were putting a focus, in my opinion, on the wrong thing. When you're looking at a platform, you can have 10, 12 racks in process at the same time. So your protocol length may be 50 minutes, but you're gonna constantly have material coming off of your stainer. Whereas when we were doing things by hand back in the day, it was oftentimes a lot easier to have just one or two racks staining at the same time. So you didn't have five or six timers going off you know, all over the place. This made it a lot easier. Um, so the other thing that's really nice too is you're much, much um, more able to follow your reagent management and make sure that your reagents are refreshed after a specified amount of time and a specified number of slides or runs going through them. All right, so when we look at protocols, um, this is usually where folks struggle. And the reason I say that is everybody has their own preference of what they wanna see under the scope. What's the shortest possible time I can get, especially when you're looking on the clinical side of things, turnaround time is huge. And that's usually one of the things that kind of trips people up a little bit because again, when you're talking about platforms, you're talking about having you know, many things happening at the same time as opposed to just one or two racks at the same time. Um, we wanna reduce those touch points, but then depending on what you're doing, how many touch points are there actually? And is the cost of doing it on a platform actually worth it? Depending on what it is you're doing, it may not be worth it. Um, in most cases it is, but you know, it just depends on your particular laboratory and what your, uh, your end game is. So remember, at the end of the day, we have we want to have good quality and reproducible results. We want it to be cost effective. And honestly, that's going to be the biggest concerns from, from most laboratories is the quality and, of course, the overall cost. So what kind of protocols do we want to run? Well, there are generally three different types. Uh, progressive, which means there's no differentiation step. It goes hematoxylin, water, bluing, water, alcohol, eosin. Now, modified regressive or progressive, depending on, you know, if your glass is half empty, glass is half full person, um, the, there is a differentiation step utilized. However, the only purpose of that differentiation step is to get rid of the blue background. It's not going to impact your nuclear detail at all. And of course, regressive staining means we're gonna overstain with our hematoxylin, then we're gonna use that acid to gently bring back and remove that background, but also remove any excess dye from the nuclei. So uh, general rules when you're looking at protocols, uh, your H&E, you wanna have your de wax step to get rid of the paraffin. Then you're gonna hydrate it. That's usually done after going from xylene to a pure alcohol to a graded alcohol to water. Of course, then our hematoxylin differentiator bluing. Now we're going to start to introduce alcohol back in so we can do our eosin step. Then once it comes out of eosin, we're going to dehydrate it, going, starting usually with a graded alcohol, going to pure alcohol, and then for our clearing step, moving into xylene, toluene, or some other aliphatic hydrocarbon solvent. And then we'll go to cover slipping. Um, the thing to remember with this too is whatever you're using for your clearing, that's often the, be the best reagent that you use in your cover slipper, or if you're, ma if you're manually cover slipping, you wanna make sure that's gonna be compatible with whatever mounting media you choose to use. The thing that's nice about this basic protocol is it's really easy to reproduce, and your reagents are gonna be resilient enough to, a large, to allow for a large number of slides to go through um, before your reagents need to be changed. 
that is so huge, uh, especially if you're a laboratory where you're running a thousand slides every day. You want to know that your reagents and your setup is going to be able to tolerate that much workload. So when we look at de-waxing and, and hydrating, um, while xylene is going to be the most common solvent, at least in the United States, we use it uh, pretty much exclusively or some type of xylene substitute. There are lots of other things that you can use in its place. Um, some folks use toluene. Of course, we talked about xylene substitutes. Um, there are things uh, with citric oils in them like citrusol, limoline. Uh, those are all different solvents. The thing is, you want to make sure that whatever you are using, you're going to be able to tolerate the slide volume that you're putting through the reagent. And you know, these things are all materials that are going to have to have special waste, just like xylene. Now, depending on, on where you're at, those rules may vary slightly, but by the end of the day, they really are important for, uh, to understand exactly what your local regulations are regarding waste of any of those solvents. Um, now, once the paraffin has been removed during the de-waxing step, it's great because now you can go into your, your alcohols and then your water and then move on for the rest of your staining. Um, the water wash at the end of your graded alcohol is what's actually going to finish that rehydration and it's getting it ready for the hematoxylin. So depending on which hematoxylin you use, you want to make sure that there's plenty of time to get whatever coloration you're looking for. Um, so once you've got to that sweet spot where you're like, this is what I like, now the slide's going to be rinsed. That's essentially going to stop the process. And it's just going to remove any excess stain. Then if you want to differentiate your slide, you can certainly do that. And then even control it even more by how long you leave it in that differentiator. Keep in mind, this is also going to include your background staining. So you do want to make sure that if you are going to use a differentiator, keep that in the back of your mind that any additives you may have added to your water bath, some folks use albumin, uh, some folks use stay on, or if you're using charged glass slides, all of those things are gonna pick up your hematoxylin to some extent. So your differentiator here is gonna be uh, certainly something to consider while you're, while you're doing this. And of course, once you're done with the differentiation, the water rinse is gonna stop that. Now you're gonna go into your bluing, you can use other buffers. Um, Scott's tap water is one of the most common ones. It's very easy to make, and it's not going to be something that's going to necessarily uh, have as big of an impact on quality as, say, not being able to mix your own hematoxylin correctly. So just keep that in mind as well. But it is going to change that reddish cast to the desired blue, as we saw on the previous uh, slides. All right, well, before we had eosin, of course, we wanna make sure we use that 95% alcohol to get that sample ready to accept this alcohol-based dye. What's really fun about eosin is you can adjust that coloration just with minor time changes. This eosin is, eosin's amazing in that it will turn anything pink very, very quickly. And if you've ever made ematoxylin from powder, you know that that powder is finer than confectioner's sugar. And that said, if you get it on anything, you may not see it right away, but as soon as water hits it, it turns pink. Um, when you are staining, when I optimize slides for customers, I will do anything um, as low as 15 minutes, generally up to one minute, and I'll make those changes in 15 second increments. Any shorter or shorter than that, you're probably not gonna get, get enough of a difference to be able to go, ah, um, if you do it too long, then you're going to go from light pink to extraordinarily bright pink. And that is that can be painful on the eyes if you're not used to seeing that. Um, the eosin, of course, is differentiated typically with a 95% ethanol. It's going to stop the staining process. Some folks will use a 50 or 70%. It just depends, again, on what you want to do. The more water in that alcohol following the eosin is going to pull out more of that pink color for you. So if you're tending to overstain with your eosin, you can use a 50%, 70%. Um, those will pull that water out, uh, excuse me, pull out the eosin because they have such a high water content. Um, normally, like I said, we would do 95% in ethanol. Um, and then you're going to go from that to a pure alcohol. And then, of course, to your clearing uh, so that you can get that slide cover slipped and ready to view. Let's talk a little bit about solvents. 
there's a lot of different choices out there for your de-waxing and dehydrating. Of course, here in the U.S., we tend to use xylene. Um, that's our most common, but that's not to say there certainly aren't others out there that are worth using. Uh, some places will like to use toluene. And then, of course, we have the wide variety of xylene substitutes that are out there. The thing to know about xylene substitutes, generally speaking, they're going to be a lot less tolerant to water. So if you have ambient humidity, you're going to start to see decreases in quality. One of the things you may notice is if there is water in your clearance and it goes to cover slip in a few days, you might notice a pink haze shifting across your slide. That's actually that water that was captured in that uh, clearant actually pulling the, the eosin out and you're starting to see that drift across the slide. Of course, with any of these substitutes, they are gonna have the same waste disposal requirements. So keep in mind, not only are you getting a product that you can't use as long, but you're gonna have to dispose of it the same way and that can be extremely costly. Um, there may not be a compatible mounting media out there for that solvent. Citrus-based solvents, which are my personally my least favorite, those are things that can actually, because they're so aromatic, can actually cause reagent sensitivities in folks. And I've seen this in laboratories where after working with them um, for a few months, folks will start to get migraines around things that they wouldn't have not uh, wouldn't have otherwise been bothered by, which is to me is kind of sad. I, I like the idea of what's behind it. But at the end of the day, it's not necessarily the best fit. That doesn't mean don't use it. It's just that's been my experience. So there is a lot of different protocols out there. I have my personal preference. Of course, you see this here on the slide. Um, I try to keep it very, very simple. You do want to make sure that your slides are dry so you can always add an oven step if you want to. The oven step, um, you know, 15 minutes at 60 degrees is fine. Um, we can, we'll talk a little bit about some of the artifacts that you can see and what causes them. One of those things is can potentially be that oven step. But you can see here, um, you have uh, our xylene, xylene 100, 195. And we go right into a wash station or hematoxylin. And then all the way back out. And again, the back end is essentially a, the reverse of the front end. Um, 95, 100, 100, xylene, xylene out. Now, some of these steps I do keep as exact. And the reason for that is, of course, you don't want your hematoxylin to potentially be in there longer than four minutes if four minutes is your sweet spot for your color. Same thing is true for your differentiator. This is a very key component. Um, bluing, most folks just make it exact because it's a staining component. Um, it's not as nearly as critical as having your differentiator your hematoxylin. And then, of course, when you get to your eosin, we want that to be exact. But we also want that first 95 and that first 100 following it to be exact because the 95 has water in it. So if you have it in there for a minute and your stainer builds intolerances to allow racks to continuously be moving through, what will happen is it could stay in there longer, which means it's going to pull more eosin out. Now, because your rack coming out of that 95 is going to go into that first 100% ethanol, there is going to be some water carried over just because the slides aren't coming out of that 95 dry. So I make that step generally exact as well for the same reason to reduce the potential for any bleeding of the eosin. So balance, of course, is really important. We want to get the color quality that we'd like, but we also want to make sure that we get the balance of the blue and the pink. What's really interesting is you can see in this slide the difference, uh, two minutes in hematoxylin for the sample on the left versus four minutes for the sample on the right. Now, um, I can also have fun with this by playing with my eosin. By increasing my eosin time, yes, everything will be a little bit darker, but I can play with my two hematoxylin and eosin uh, colors because they do play off of each other. So what will happen is um, if your pink is really bright, it's naturally going to make the blue of your nuclei seem a little bit lighter. And the other way around, if your nuclei are super dark, your eosin may look a lot lighter in color underneath the scope, and it's just because of the balance. Um, simply doing things like if you want your eosin to be brighter, maybe dialing back the nuclear stain just a smidge, and by that I mean 30 seconds to a minute, might make all the difference that you need to get that eosin to the brightness that you like without compromising your nuclear detail. 
So the other thing that's kind of fun to think about too, is when you're looking at your stain quality, uh, looking at things grossly is not always your best friend. So I always, always recommend folks review their slides uh, under the scope before they decide whether the intensity is appropriate. As you can see here, I've got a nice piece of tonsil followed by a piece of lung and then a piece of fatty breast tissue. Notice that those all look like wildly different when it comes to how much hematoxylin was picked up. Of course, a lot of that is gonna be due to the tonsil being highly cellular with very little cytoplasm. Of course, your lung tissue has a lot of open spaces in it, so it makes it look like that pink is hardly there, right? And then when you look at the fatty breast, it's even more difficult to see any nuclei there at all. Um, those are all stained at the exact same protocol, the exact same hematoxylin and neosin stainings. However, the cellular components themselves are driving the differences in gross appearance. So we wanna be thoughtful of that. If we are making a decision about whether we like something, uh, if we think it's the right colors or not, always go microscopically um, because grossly can throw you off. Should I run a control slide? I always recommend that you do. Now, I'm a big fan of sausage blocks. Those are analogous to microarrays, except they're way cheaper to make. Um, I like to use things like to uh, tonsil. Tonsil is great because it's highly cellular, very low cytoplasm. Um, so you're really gonna get the nice intense blue. Colon, of course, is fabulous. It has the a lot of cytoplasm. You can also get muscle fibers and some fat connected to that as well. So you, again, you're gonna have a range of cell types to be able to look at microscopically. And of course, skin is nice. A dermatologist oftentimes will have a particular color scheme that they're going for. Um, and if that's what you're studying in your lab, whoever is gonna be reviewing your slides, these are the three things that are gonna give you an idea in one simple slide of how your stain is gonna work across a variety of different sample types. So I, I strongly recommend using this as a control. Is it absolutely necessary to use these three skin types? No, uh, feel free to make something, a sausage block, make it your own. If you're predominantly doing liver and stomach, then make your control um, consistent with that. That way you'll know exactly what you should be expecting. So optimization is a question that I hear about a lot. Um, how do I perform it? Now, normally when I'm doing optimization for my customers, I will take a look at their slides, what they currently have, and I'll ask them, do you like this? Um, sometimes they say, yep. Sometimes they say no. And then I have to unpack exactly what it is that they don't like about it. What I'll do, and like I said on that previous with the sausage block, um, I'll, I'll pick breast, colon, skin, tonsil, and uterus, because again, that covers a nice wide variety of different uh, sample types and different nuclear to cytoplasmic configurations. So that said, I will also then grab my, my preferred stain. I will stain uh, my, my uh, sample slide with what they already have, and then I will tweak it with whatever stains I'm bringing in to work with the customer and I will use that and try to match them. If the customer is like, I have no idea, I just want something better than this, I will usually sit down and ask them, well, what does that mean for you? And then if they want it to be more blue, if they want it to be more pink, depending on you know what direction they want to go with it, I'm very easily able to help them adjust their stain to get exactly what they're looking for color-wise. Um, Typically, when I'm doing an optimization, I will increase or decrease my hematoxylin by 30 seconds, um, and of course, my ESN by 15 seconds. If you really want to get nuanced about it, you can even go further and adjust your time of your differentiator. Just adjusting it from one minute to a minute and 30 seconds is going to make your hematoxylin just a little bit less pale. Um, but for simplicity's sake, you know, we'll go with just increasing or decreasing the hematoxylin and then increasing and decreasing your eosin. So when I am doing this, I will have several different sets of slides. I will put the put my different stain variations. I'll have that in a little table and I assign randomization codes. Uh, part of the reason I do that is because there's a lot of folks that 
think they know what four minutes in hematoxylin looks like on every possible hematoxylin out there. And of course, that's not the case. So to get them away from trying to assign numbers to things, what I like to do is just give them slides and say, tell me what you like. And by not giving them any other information except here's your slides, tell me what you think, uh, that forces them to go strictly on what they like to see and not necessarily adding in any other, is my hematoxylin long enough? Do I want my eosin to be shorter? Whatever any of those extra variables will be, it makes it very, very simple. Now, one of the challenges I will tell you that I see from time to time is water quality. And water quality will make four minutes in hematoxylin look very different depending on what the problem is with your water quality. Um, so again, this is why when I do my optimization, I give them randomization codes and I have them write down what they like and what they don't like. And then we go back from there and adjust it. And what's really great is it makes it so much less stressful when you're working with whoever is reviewing the slides directly and it just simplifies it for them and it makes it so much easier for you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how these things are supposed to look under the microscope. All right, if we take a look at this slide, you'll see a nice piece of normal lymph node. Uh, what's really interesting about this one is it doesn't look like there's very much eosin in it at all. Of course, keep in mind that our nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio is very different here than what we would see on uh, a well-differentiated squamous cell, for example, with a tiny nucleus and lots of cytoplasm. But you can also see um, the nuclei are very clear. We have some stromal cells in here, of course, some red blood cells. Everything looks nice and crisp. All right, now this is a really nice piece of placenta. And as you can see here, we have some variation in our eosins. Uh, we do have a lot more cytoplasm here. So the nuclei are gonna take a back seat a little bit to the pink, but you'll see that we again have different colors of the pink in here. So it's really showcasing that cytoplasmic detail. So how do we get everything balanced? We'll take a look at this slide here. We have a nice section of lymphocytes on the top with muscle fibers underneath. This is again where that balance is very important and why you wanna make sure that your control slides represent a variety of tissues. And the top half of the slides, it looks like we only stained it with hematoxylin. And of course that's because there really isn't any cytoplasm around your uh, lymphocytes. Those are very, very uh, small cells of course with almost no cytoplasm. As we go down to the muscle fibers though, you'll notice that cytoplasm is the predominant component here. So even though we still have periodic nuclei, of course, within the cells, you can see that we have, and the colors are exactly the same between the lymphocytes, coloration of the nuclei and the nuclei down here in the muscle fibers, but notice how rich that pink is. With this particular sample, um, we would be able to dim the light a little bit and you'd actually be able to see the refractile nature of those muscle fibers. But again, this is one of those things where it's really important to understand just how that balance can make a difference depending on how many nuclei you have versus how much cytoplasm. And this one is really interesting. This is an adenocarcinoma of the colon. And you can see where we have some normal nuclei and then we get right into the abnormal ones. Now the malignant nuclei are very irregular in shape. And you can notice that because of the different amount of DNA now that's in these, uh, you're gonna see some different coloration as you go through all those nuclei. But for foundation, we have some pink in here with some red blood cells. We have some stroma. And of course we have some lymphocytes around here. So that's one of the things that you can always use as a guidepost. Take a look at the, nu the normal nuclei that are in your piece of tissue, and you can be able to see a, a pretty strong difference between those and your malignant nuclei. And it's really profound depending on what you're looking at. Looking at this one, now this is actually a, a, a piece of tonsil. Now this one is incredibly pink. In this particular case, the preference of the reviewer was to have a much lighter nuclear stain and really enhance the eosin in the background. Now for me personally, I don't care for this balance, but I'm not the one that's reviewing the slide. So this is certainly not wrong by any means, but in my opinion, it's not ideal. 
So this is where you want to make sure that your slide reviewer has um, the uh, most say in what they want to see microscopically. All right, so now let's talk about how when things are not what we want to see. Let's talk about water quality. So you can see slide A here and slide B. Slide A and slide B are from the same block, but they look very, very different. Water quality is often an issue I see in the field. And of course, one side, it could be very, very acidic. The other side, it could be very, very basic. Uh, when your water is very acidic, that's not gonna negatively impact your hematoxylin because essentially you're taking acid water and putting it into an, an acid dye. And by keeping that pH appropriate in your hematoxylin, you're not gonna deplete it. Now, when you come out of hematoxylin, though, and you go into that wash following it, that acid water is actually going to decolorize your slide a little bit before you put it in your differentiator. So every subsequent water wash after that is going to pull more and more hematoxylin out. If your water is basic, now what's going to happen is you have a higher pH liquid carrying over into your hematoxylin. That's going to weaken your hematoxylin, and it's not going to allow it over time to continue the nice coloration that you would be used to if you had stable water. So your first slides of the day may look great, but as the day progresses and more and more of the, the alkaline water gets added into your hematoxylin just by normal carryover, you're actually gonna start to see your hematoxylin lighten up a little bit. So this is one of those things that if you're getting inconsistent staining and you're not sure why, uh, the pet store and water testing strips is a great way to just test your water and get a ballpark of where you're at. This doesn't have to be dead exact 7.1 measurements. We're talking, is it 7.5? Is it 9? That's what's going to help you with this particular um, artifact, is to make sure that your water is stable. That will give you stable staining overall. Now, when folks bake their slides, which I completely agree, it's, it's great. It helps you dry your slide quickly. It actually melts that paraffin a little bit. So when it goes into that first xylene, you have a nice warm slide that, that wax is gonna come out very, very easily. The problem is, is some folks try to do too much with the heat. Putting it in a really hot oven, and there's a lot of water underneath it, is actually gonna vaporize that water through the nuclei, which of course are proteins, and it's going to create nuclear artifacts like you see here, which we call soap bubbles. Um, now, when you're looking at a prostate tumor, the downside to this is that not only are these nuclei very, very fragile, nuclear changes like that can actually be indicative of some malignancy, such as thyroid cancer. Uh, one of the trademarks is to have a nuclear uh, hole in it, like you see here. Uh, the downside is if you're patient has a normal thyroid, but it goes through the temperatures like this and ends up causing nuclear bubbling, it can actually create a false positive because you'll be misinterpreting what would normally be considered standard diagnostic criteria for a particular tumor. So you want to bake with care is the bottom line here. And there is no going back from this. Once you've got air bubbles, there's no way to fix this, unfortunately. Now, some of the things that we use when we're doing our stains can leave pigment behind. Formalin pigment is, is one of the big things. You can see some of it here. Um, if you're using good quality reagents, it's not as much of an issue, but some of the poorer quality ones, some of the poor quality hematoxylins, if they're not filtered, you can actually start to see some of these pigments in here. Um, your fixatives can also impact that. Back in the day, we used to use Zenkers, which was a combination of mercuric chloride and potassium dichromate, and oftentimes we would see this type of particulate. Don't let those things uh, dissuade you from making your diagnosis. Um, these things can unfortunately show up and they have in, in some cases tripped folks up. So just to be aware that they are out there. Cautery artifact is another uh, issue that we see. Um, with this, you'll notice how one end is kind of blackened and kind of fried, and all the nuclear detail there is, is gone. This is, again, something that we'll see during processing. 
One of the things that can also cause that is if you take your biopsies out and you like to use sponges or wraps, make sure that you make those sponges and wraps wet with whatever your fixative is. Never, ever, ever put a sample onto dry paper towel and then try to wrap it up in that little piece of wrap and put it in a cassette because what that's going to do is pull all the liquid out of your sample and you'll actually start to see some of these edges like this. Um, this is also can be caused by uh, when the sample is collected. If you're using a cautering iron to, to collect your sample, this will also happen as well. So just keep that in mind as you are working uh, through your H&Es. When you do see stuff like this, consider that tissue trauma on the front end before it even got to the stainer could be causing your problem. Let's talk about pore deparaffinization. So in this slide, you can see we have some irregular staining. We have some light pink here at the bottom, darker pink toward the top. Um, this is a sign that your slide has not been appropriately deparaffinized. So what can cause it? Well, if your reagents are really, really dirty, um, your solvents, maybe you've been using them a lot and you haven't had a chance to refresh them. Maybe you don't have enough time in your solvent. I prefer to keep mine in around two minutes and I have two changes of xylene. And that works really nicely for getting out all of my paraffin. But if you're finding that that's not working for you, there's no harm in adding a third xylene if you want to. Um, I just, again, try to minimize the amount of waste on my instrument. And, and that's part of the way that I do that is by having my two steps. Also, keep in mind, if you're not drying your slides long enough before you stain them and you put them on there, the water is gonna prevent the xylene from actually getting to that paraffin. So the best way to prevent this from happening is change your reagents regularly. And of course, make sure your slides are nice and dry before you put them on the stainer. Let's talk about poor dehydration. So in this slide, we can see there's some excess water left behind after we've gone through our dehydration steps on the way to cover slipping. And you can see I have an arrow pointing toward it here in the photo, but you can definitely see there's water at different spots here. So what can actually cause that? If your laboratory is very, very humid, you can actually get some of that ambient humidity into your xylenes. Of course, the other thing is if you're not changing your xylenes often enough, you can actually have water carry over from when it leaves Eason to the 95 to the 100s, you'll actually start to get some water going across that. So that's why we do have uh, recommended changes for your reagents. The biggest way to reduce this problem, make sure that your reagents are changed regularly. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we don't have any water in anything. If your lab feels like it's very humid, you can always purchase a hygrometer, with, that's with a G, and that will tell you what your room humidity is. Most staining equipment doesn't have a really tight range for humid conditions, so you're generally going to be able to have quite a bit of leeway, but if you want to just track your humidity in your lab, that's one way to do that, and it'll certainly help prevent issues like this one. And as I mentioned before, if there's water in your sample, you will start to see over time as your slides hang out in there, you know, when you put them in storage, you'll actually see a pink cast shifting across the slide because that's the eosin coming out of the tissue. It's actually kind of neat to see, but it also makes me sad when I see it. Now we've all had those days where the tissue comes off the processor and we go to embed it and we know it's gonna be a rough day because it's super, super dry and crunchy. Well, in order to accommodate that, oftentimes we'll soak. Now, I prefer my processing to be amazing so that I don't have to soak anything, but you don't always get what you want, right? So that said, if you are having to soak your samples, you wanna do it and be thoughtful about it. Um, now, I can't say don't soak it longer than five minutes because that's gonna vary depending on how uh, dry your sample is, but, if you over soak, and unfortunately I do see this quite often, you can actually get some artifacts. So notice on these nuclei here, this is actually a uh, colon. And you notice how we have no nuclear detail at all. They look kind of cloudy and kind of swollen. 
when you are rehydrating on your when you're soaking when you're getting ready to cut them unfortunately what will happen is it will create these types of artifacts which can cause you to lose that nuclear detail that in some cases can be so critical to diagnosis prostate cancer is a great example of that because it's not known for being um, extremely hyperchromatic so when you do lose that that nuclear um, salt and pepper chromatin that we would expect to see with the swelling when we lose that detail, that can oftentimes um, negatively impact on how we're doing our diagnostics. Now let's talk about some troubleshooting. So most of the common h and &E related artifacts are very simply corrected. Uh, first of all, you always wanna use quality reagents. So make sure your stains are of good quality, your ancillaries, your alcohols and xylenes, those are all of good quality. And periodically test your water. Uh, you'd be surprised how much heavy rainfall or heavy snowfall can actually stir up the groundwater and give you wide variations in your, uh, your tap water. Filter your stains as needed to avoid floaters. If you have a lot of staining and processing of dry samples, floaters are always a risk. It's always a great idea to filter your stains just to make sure that you do remove any of that excess tissue or excess particulate that can happen in your some of your uh, lower quality hematoxylins. You want to filter those to get that out so you don't see that on your slides. Cover your reagent containers uh, if you're not using them. So if you're going home for the evening, you want to cover those. You don't want them to be evaporating. You don't want them to be negatively impacted by your laboratory ambient environment. Um, and you can always have a hygrometer on hand to monitor humidity. They're very inexpensive and they're pretty easy to get your hands on, but they're a really helpful tool. Um, maintain your instruments, I can't stress that enough. Doing good maintenance on them, having your annual PMs, those things are so critical to keeping all of these things running smoothly for you. And of course, reach out to your vendor and get some refresher training for your staff. It's really interesting, some of the places that I visit, I do have team members that don't get to spend as much time with the instruments. And then of course, there's a day when all of the other key users are off and they have to go and use uh, their instrument and try to figure out how to troubleshoot it when they may have touched it once or twice throughout you know, a three month period, for example. So it's always good to give uh, refresher training for your staff and depending of course on, on your locality, uh, certification does require so many continuing education credits every year. So it's also a great opportunity to uh, refresh your staff with their instruments, also the basics of H&E, but to get them those continuing education credits to maintain certification. All right, the do's. Always run a QC slide to make sure everything's looking good. If you change out your hematoxylin, go ahead and run another QC slide. We want to make sure that that hematoxylin is performing to the uh, expectations of your team. If you change your ancillary reagents and you want to change out your whole instrument at once, run a QC slide to make sure it is all looking good. But you should always run one um, before your first rack of tissues in the morning just to make sure everything's looking good. Make sure that you have good uh, wash water on your instrument. This one is so important. Uh, make sure that your pH is where you need it to be and that you have good water pressure. Too low pressure can make your slide rinses ineffective or less effective than they otherwise would be. Do select a protocol that's gonna make sense for your slide reviewer. Make sure that you're meeting their expectations. It's gonna make your life so much easier. Always, always use quality reagents. And of course, filter your stains to reduce particulate and floaters. The don'ts. Do not rush your staining times. Um, there is nothing worse than trying to push something through and then having to redo it again because there was water in the xylene. Um, the hematoxylin isn't dark enough. Always take your time. It'll save you time in the big picture. Don't overuse your reagents. I know that it might seem like you're gonna be saving a lot of money if you get just a few more slides, uh, but always try to follow the manufacturer recommendations for throughput, because if you try to push it, it oftentimes can come back and your slides will not look as good as you want it to. Um, I usually discourage folks from using recycled reagents 
only because most folks don't test those reagents for purity. So if you're doing your ethanols, for example, on a uh, recycler, and you're not making sure that you're actually getting 98 to 100% purity, you can actually be adding water to your xylenes because remember on your dehydration step, you're going from a graded alcohol to a pure alcohol to a solvent. If that pure alcohol is coming off your dehydrator recycler and you think it's pure, but it's not, now you're adding other contaminants into your xylenes and that's gonna impede uh, your coloration and of course your cover slipping. And always, always, um, or I should say, never, never neglect your staff. Uh, make sure that they have good training and you do do annual reviews for competency on using your equipment. Very, very important. Um, it's it's amazing, especially as, as hectic as it can be in the laboratory. Um, if we don't get those refreshers, sometimes maintenance kind of goes to the wayside a little bit. And so we definitely want to make sure that not only is everyone comfortable, but your instrument is given the love it deserves. The bottom line, a good H&E is going to keep your slide reviewers happy, and it's going to make sure that they have the best possible foundation for diagnosis. Whenever you're working on your H&Es, you always want to make sure that your colors look good and your slide reviewers are getting exactly what they need. There's always a patient at the end of whatever it is you're doing, so we do want to make sure that those foundations are as optimal as they possibly can be. One of the key takeaways as well is that your stain is only going to be as good as your processing. If you're finding that you can't achieve what you're trying to do with your H&E, take a look at your tissue processing and make sure that it's as optimized as possible. You don't want to be having to soak samples for a long period of time. And of course, there's nothing worse than cutting into a piece of fatty tissue, laying it on your water bath and watching it explode because the center of that tissue hasn't been appropriately infiltrated. So please keep these things in mind and you're going to have the best possible H&E experience and your slide reviewers will be really, really happy with you. Thank you for attention today. I really appreciate you guys joining our webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to share them now. We'd like to open it up for any thoughts, comments that you might have.